yes. Uh, we we, we uh, annexed, we, we didn't annex, we brought Texas in. She had won her independence from Mexico, and so we brought Texas in as a southern state. And then we had the territories of Arizona, New Mexico came in. And California was already a state by 1850, as you know. Mm -hmm. There was a California regiment, I believe, in the Civil yes. War. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Oregon was a, a state by then. And then we had the, the Great Plains, or the, where the nomadic Indian tribes happened to be. Uh, the, the nation expanded. We were 45 states when I uh, uh, led the first United 40, States. My goodness, 40. Five states. We, we ended up 36. Oh, uh, well, that's right. There were two that's added right. during the, the war. And how do you govern such a, a state? And not only did the nation itself grow, and this is one of the things that I'm proud about, is the Americans saw a need for us to expand our influence to territories such as the islands of Hawaii. I'm not sure how familiar you are with those Pacific islands. Out in the Pacific, the, 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 Cook, Hawaii, the Cook Islands. Oh, yes, right, Captain Cook. very good. Oh, Thank yeah. you, sir. Uh, how did and you pronounce that? Hawaiian. Oh. Well, they called it Ohaihi when I was in per in office. I, I think you're thinking of the land of Ohaihi. Oh, oh, Ohaihi. And the, I corresponded with the king, Kam Kameha, Kamehameha, or Kamehameha. Very well, yes. <laughs> but nonetheless, we called well, it Ohaihi. But by, I, by the I don't mean to interrupt. We had annexed those islands, oh. and we had taken over the control of, uh, of the Philippine Islands. Uh, to, way over toward Japan, and uh, uh, oh, Cuba, <laughs> Cuba, Puerto Rico. I mean, the, the world had expanded, and we had been a part of that world. Oh, that is good thing. news. See, when when this our war was going on, yeah, the Europeans, uh, from what I understood, from one of my secretaries on my cabinet was very well appraised of world events, Mr. Seward, mm -hmm. and and he said the kings of Europe were dreadfully concerned that the American system might catch hold in the rest of the world. And so during this war, while we were occupied trying to reassemble our union, mm -hmm. three European powers sailed over. There had been an election in Mexico, and a, a man named Benito Juarez mm -hmm. um, was elected and wanted Mexico to become like the United States, mm -hmm. free and open. And, and he threw the Europeans out, and they were in arms. They came over and threw him out of office. He was a, a refugee in his own country during our war, pleaded mm -hmm. for help from us. We couldn't give it to him. And for all the world, I thought that the Europeans would, were now going to uh, reinstate the divine right of kings. And, and so you're saying that our influence has actually grown. Oh, uh, That's yeah, absolutely. We were a nation young and, and vital. Uh, we had great dreams when you gentlemen were in. We were sane during yeah, your time. Yeah. And we've only expanded on that to, well, to the point where we became a, we became a world power. We Americans had something to say, and by golly, wow. it would do well of Europe to pay attention to us. That is encouraging. It reminds me of a story. Uh, I recall coming back from France and I would get asked questions as I was uh, a minister plenipotentiary, um, first under Jay, uh, and uh, in any case, I would go to the various activities and many people said, did you meet the kings, did you meet the earls and dukes? And I said, in all honesty, there are very few among that class would be elected a vestryman at any one of our churches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, he's, he, he's not wrong. I, uh, I went to the uh, funeral of Edward, uh, Edward the uh, Seventh, I believe. I get all those numbers of those kings mixed up. In 1910, uh, I was coming back from a safari in Africa, <clears throat> and he happened to die at that time, and I was asked by the pr then president if I would represent the United States at the funeral. And I, quite honestly, I was quite taken with all the European oh, 
formality and uniforms and all this, the collar and the pageantry. <clears throat> and I had planned to wear my Army Rough Rider uniform that I wore in, in the war with Spain. You know, I was only a colonel. There was a war with Spain. Yeah, we had a war with Spain, and we won it, by the way. But Edith, my Mrs. Roosevelt, she said, no, Theodore, you're going to wear a tuxedo and top hat, which is the, the clothing of the day, formal clothing of the day. She said, you're not going to wear that ragged old uniform. But I was kind of proud of it. That's what an American soldier would look like amongst all those kings and queens and such. But that was one of the few disappointments I had as president. Well, you know, you two gentlemen are familiar with Napoleon. His yeah. grandson came mm -hmm. in the midst of our war and showed up at the doorstep of the executive man. Well, they called it the White House, the People's House. The exec they couldn't make up their mind by the time I lived long <laughs> what to call the place. But he showed up at the front door uh, one day unannounced <laughs> and uh, uh, invited himself for dinner, essentially. I really had no time for the man, but Mrs. Lincoln was quite taken oh, with yes. all the, the fluff and carryings on. Of, and they spent the entire evening speaking French, which I had. <laughs> Uh, I was, well, patient, I'll say. May I interject a story? And I realize our conversation has, has been quite weighty. But uh, there was an occasion that took place uh, in, during my administration. I'm sorry, sir, you were not there. But um, I had an event that took place, and you brought up uh, the uh, emperor. Uh, First, he was first counsel, and it was due to his um, decision that I was able to obtain the Louisiana Territory. In any case, once we had made the arrangements, and uh, Colonel Monroe and Mr. or Chancellor Livingston had worked out the negotiation in, in Paris, then we began to go forward and Mr. Bonaparte decided he wasn't certain he could trust the Americans to fill, uh, fulfill their responsibility of paying the 15 millions of dollars that uh, had been negotiated. So he sent his younger brother Jerome over. Mm -hmm. Jerome came and as it turned out he went to Baltimore first and he mm -hmm. met a uh, lovely young lady by the name of um, Miss Patterson. Uh, she was the daughter of one of the richest merchants mm. in the New World. Mm. And he fell in love with her and married her. Oh my. This was causing some distress for us because here you have someone in this, um, the aristocrats of Europe have come over and married a commoner. Well, I was hosting her in the executive mansion, and we were going to have a reception. Now, this young lady was very enchanted with the uh, French manners and the French dress, shall I say. Mm -hmm. And it was at that time, um, all of the congressmen came to this reception, all of the congressmen's wives, and Mr. Jerome Bonaparte and his new bride entered, and she was, to put it delicately, in a state of dishabelle. Um, and all of the congressmen gathered around her. The wives were not happy. <laughs> I went to my Secretary of State, Mr. Madison, and I said, I have dealt with the political matters. We are dealing with the economic matters, but sir, if these congressmen are taken home by their wives, we will have no purchase at all. <laughs> <laughs> it was of all people, Mrs. Madison had already ascertained what was happening. She went over to the young lady, wrapped a shawl around her, and escorted her and introduced her to each congressman and his wife. Uh. Now, while that did not please each lady, it did allow their husbands to approve uh, for the purchase. Uh. <laughs> Wisdom. But at least she was covered up during uh. the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Wisdom. My goodness. Uh, we had, you seemed surprised when I mentioned the war with Spain. 
Yeah. Well, that was, uh, well, that was under Mr. McKinley's administration, and it wasn't really much of a war. We, we won the first battle, we won the last battle, and we won every battle in between. Oh. But the Secretary of State was a gentleman you know quite well, Mr. John Hay. Oh my goodness! He advanced from Pike County. He advanced very well since he I expect was your so, secretary. Having been a farmer when you know, I yeah. know him, and he's the one who kind of gave it its identifying title, if you will. He called it the Splendid Little War, and he was he was quite right, and that set us on the course to uh, an imperial uh, nature for the, the yeah. nation at the time. But he introduced my father to you. And I, I don't expect you remember Theodore Roosevelt Sr., but he also introduced my father to Mrs. Lincoln, and Mrs. Lincoln had asked my father to accompany her on several shopping trips because my father was well-versed in the fashions of the time. Well, Mrs. Lincoln had any number of people who would be willing to go with her on shopping trips. <laughs> but, you know, it's an interesting thing, this idea of the, of the stratified society mm -hmm. and the people of, of import and, and social standing. When I was elected, I, I came from a very poor background and people were incensed, including apparently the King of Spain, which mm -hmm. made me think of it, your comments. And, and, and according to Mr. Seward, because we were in a civil war, he said that was the logical outcome of a society that allowed the dregs of civilization to ascend to heights oh to which they had no yes. business going. Yes. Oh and, 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 and it wasn't just the king of Spain who thought that. It was a good many of, of educated, well-heeled mm -hmm. Americans yes. who thought I had absolutely no business being elected, that it was only the, a, a better class of people that should be involved in governing. But the premise of the co country has always been that anyone can arise and ascend through all of that paraphernalia to the highest of heights. But even without royalties and without titles and nobilities, it's still difficult. I get to receptions. I used to get to receptions. I don't so much anymore. And they looked at me with the greatest of disdain. And they had no mm -hmm. title of nobility. They'd simply been to Harvard and decided that they should have a title of nobility. Well, I laugh sometimes because I believe much. what Mr. Jefferson said is still true no matter what anybody else says. Well, unfortunately, in my time as president, it had begun, it had become more than that. The, the classes were there, whether they, we, we, we talked the talk, but we weren't of the same class and nature as our founding fathers. Uh, uh, money became big money, uh, probably unimaginable to you. The, the country had gone into a, uh, a revolution, uh, so to speak, of industry and growth. And we're talking about huge fortunes in which were controlled by just a few men. Mm. Uh, Following the European model that we knew. Yeah. The mm. aristocracy was that of money, not of, uh, not of birth. Uh, not nobility, okay. okay. Yes, and, and the, the actions were much the same, the, 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 and reactions were much the same. And if you wanted to gain anywhere in, in the political world, mm. you had to somehow play their game, and they, uh, and I say they, I mean the gentlemen who have power, they did not much appreciate that. It, quite honestly, it took somebody like me who did not have to kowtow to anybody else for money. Mm -hmm. I did mm -hmm. not have to beg anybody to support me. Mm -hmm. uh, I could mm -hmm. say, this is where I stand. You're either with me or against me, or you're waiting to see what happens with it. That was a rarity, quite honestly. Mm. Men were willing to sell their soul in too many instances, too many instances. It's still a country of dreaming, uh, uh, yes. opportunity. Yes. 